Well, good morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 17. This morning, I want to preach to you on how to impact our culture without compromise. I want to start with a verse not in Acts. I want to start with Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, as I stand up here and I think about the power of the gospel. Lord, it's so critical, Lord, as, as so many have moved away from the gospel, Lord, and so many churches have moved away from your word, Lord, I pray that, God, that we will look at your word, God, that we will not compromise on your word at all. God, I pray that you will help us to have an impact on our culture without compromising on your principles. So, Lord, this morning as I speak your word, I pray that you'll hide me in my frailties, my shortcomings behind the cross. Lord, then you'll speak to the hearts of people. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit has free reign in here to do what he wants. And God, we love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever thought about how we can have the greatest impact on our culture? I mean, it's something that the church has tried to do since the beginning of time. And early in the church, the the world was literally transformed, literally turned upside down because the church preached the gospel. But it seems to me that in the last 20 or 30 years that we've, and and probably longer than that, I'm sure there's an ebb and flow constantly in this. But it seems to me that we've wandered away from God's way and how God's called us to do it to man's way, and that's a dangerous path. We've seen the church begin to teach that in order to impact our culture, we must become like the culture. Or at least we must be palatable to the culture. We're taught that we must learn the culture and we must learn the styles and we must learn all about, the, all about what the world does and then we must emulate them to reach them. And so that's what masses of churches have done. And the result is that now the culture dictates to the church who the church is supposed to be. I mean, the world loves the church when we're doing good things in the community. And let me say this, we ought to be doing good things in the community. We're going to go pray tonight at the at the schools. We ought to be doing that next week. We're going to be taking food to the um, taking food to the teachers, going to feed our teachers. We ought to do that. We take the inflatables around. We ought to do those things. They love us when we do things for the community. They love us when we stock up food banks and volunteer to renovate houses for the poor. Man, praise the church. They're awesome. And we ought to do that. And they celebrate us for our wonderful charity. But don't you dare open your mouth and call someone a sinner. Don't you dare tell someone that Jesus died for them and that he is the exclusive way to heaven. And don't you dare say that without Jesus, you are dying and going to hell. Because when you do that, you bigoted, fascist, racist, homophobic, sexist, whatever they want to call you. You see, the culture has dictated the church. So churches are lining up to do all kinds of charitable works, and we should. But if we're doing it to do charitable works, and we're not presenting the gospel, then we are not doing what Christ has called the church to do. I just preached for a couple weeks on our, our, I went back through what our purpose statement is to connect and grow and serve and go. That, that we're called to make disciples who make disciples. And if we are not making disciples who make disciples, it doesn't matter all the charitable works that we do. It doesn't matter how much we relate to culture. It doesn't matter how much we, we, uh, we 
doesn't matter. None of that matters if we're not keeping the main thing the main thing. It's gone so far that most churches have stopped preaching sin and repentance. I shared with our Sunday school class this morning that uh, Jordan told me that he was doing a quiet time with his kids this week. And he said he, he was in a story that was a familiar story and he had a children's Bible. And he said, and they took part of the story out of the Bible. Why? Well, because it's not appealing to children and it's not appealing. It is God's word. The church has stopped preaching repentance and embraced this new idea of tolerance. We, we've made sin out to be no big deal. Oh, you can, be, you can sin. It's just a little sin. Listen to me. Jesus Christ died for the smallest sin. We've changed the Bible to take out the bad parts to the point that now we have major denominations or ordaining homosexuals and transgender people. What in the world happened? How do we get back to being the church that is transforming the world? How, how do we get back to the, the power of the gospel? Let me give you a couple ways I think that we need to do that. We're in Acts chapter 17, and I want to kind of give you a background of what's happening in Acts 17. In the first half of the chapter, Paul was in Thessalonica and in Berea, and he's preaching in the synagogues, and he's preaching to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. And I, and I want you to see as we go through this that you're going to see that when Paul preached in, in, to the Jews, he preached a different way than he did to the Gentiles. And there's a reason for that. Because the Jews already had their, the, the same worldview. They understood that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. They understood that God was creator and sustainer of all things. They didn't, he didn't need to go back and rehash that. He also understood that they had the same worldview that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understands. There's none that seeks after God. They already had that down. They knew that there was a creation. They knew that there was a fall. So he could start there. What they missed was they missed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah that God had promised to the world. And so Paul, when he preaches to the Jews, he preaches Christ alone. Why? Because they missed it. He didn't have to go. They were on the same. They, they were on the same way of thinking, the same wavelength. And so when he went to the Jews, he could preach to them that way. So he knew the culture of the Jews. Paul was Jew. But he was also Roman and Paul had to know the culture. In fact, when Paul preached in Berea and Thessalonica, in fact, he was preaching in Thessalonica and they and they stirred up a mob to come kill him. So Paul and Silas escaped at night to get out of the city because the, the Bible says that they, they stirred up a mob to, um, uh, it says they stirred up a mob to get them. They were accused because they were accused of turning the world upside down. Verse six, they were turning the world upside down. How were they turning the world upside down? Were they doing a bunch of were, were they doing a bunch of services? You know what they were doing? They were preaching the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And when we move away from the gospel, you move away from the power of God. Paul goes to Athens and he goes there alone. It's like everybody's going to catch up. And I was thinking about this. Now, this isn't biblical. This is Chris's reading between the lines thinking. But Paul ends up in Athens alone. He leaves Thessalonica. And I just think maybe some of those guys were like, dude, every time this guy preaches, they hate us. And they run us out of the city and they're trying to kill us. Let's let him go there. And then we'll let the dust settle and then we'll come in there behind him.
But let's catch up now in verse 16 through 18. Paul, and he's in Athens. And it says this, While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worship God. And in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Then also some of the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers who argued with him, some said, what is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? Others replied, he seems to be a preacher of foreign deities because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. I want you to notice what happened. Paul comes to a new city. And so what's he do? He wants to get to know who are these people. And he's walking around and everywhere he walks around, there's a statue and there's another God. And there's a statue and another God and there's a statue and another God. In fact, they, there were so many statues in Greece. They said that, that uh, some genius back, way back, I think it was 600 B.C., let a group of lambs go in the city. And then they went and slaughtered the lambs. And wherever they, wherever they found a lamb, they slaughtered them and built an altar and named a God. So the city's full of idols. It's an idolatry-filled place. And he saw that they were completely engulfed in this idolatry, and his heart was broken for them. Paul didn't sit in his ivory tower and go, oh, look at those pagan people. Oh. His heart was broken for them. And he went and reasoned with them in the synagogue. He went to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He goes to the Jews and he reasoned with them. Don't you see that Christ came? That all the stuff that you've been studying your whole life, don't you realize this is the Christ? This is the Messiah? This is Jesus was the one promised and we put him on the cross and crucified him. But then he went out in the city and he got to know people. Listen, I want to tell you, we ought to be we ought to be known throughout our community and about our throughout our culture. And people ought to know that Seven Lakes Baptist Church loves them. And they have to know that Seven Lakes Baptist Church wants to serve them and Seven Lakes Baptist Church wants to do th do things for them. But notice what Paul didn't do. He didn't sit in his lounge chair and complain about how bad the world's become. I think sometimes we in the church sit around going, oh, look how bad our culture is. Oh, look how bad the world is. Oh, look how bad this is. And what are we doing to change it? He didn't blame politicians because he knew they can't do anything. Because it's the power of the gospel that transforms. It's the... Deutem or it's the, uh, the Dynamus, the, it's dynamite. That's what's going to transform. Well, that's where the Holy Spirit begins to work. When you start preaching the gospel that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again, that's what transforms the world. And church, that's who we're called to be and what we're called to do. He didn't play armchair quarterback and make a camp, campaign speech on Facebook. He didn't come up with some brilliant political uh, solution to whatever problems they had. He didn't tax and come up with tax and spend or trickle down economics or whatever leaning you happen to be. Because that will not change the world. And if you're looking for a president, if you're looking for a vice president, if you're looking for a political leader, you will not find that in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, you find the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator and sustainer of the universe, the one who spoke it all into existence and knows how it goes, and you must come to him. Why? Because he came for me and he died in my place. I wonder what we do when we see sin that's affecting every part of our world. Do we sit silently do we armchair quarterback? Do we blame everyone else as we sit in our ivory Christian tower? I want you to understand, Paul did not have a sense of superiority, but he was moved by the mandate 
of the gospel. Why? Because Paul knew that nothing that I have can change this world except Jesus. And so he preached the gospel. Now, I want you to understand something. We are called to engage our culture. We are called to go in the world, but we are not called to be like the world. And what we are seeing in our, what we're seeing in the church is the church is beginning to look exactly like the world. We talk like them. We live like them. We dress like them. We do everything that the world does. And God and Jesus said, come out from among them and be ye separate. But we don't like that. We should not be what we should be doing is we should be engaging in our culture. We should be involved in the community. But we should not be living like the world. We should not be partaking in worldly things. Paul understood his culture. So what were the results? Look at, look at verses seven, or 19 to 21. It says, And they took him and they brought him to the Are- Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting, for you bring some strange thing to our ears. We wish we knew, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. Put up the next slide. There's the, I want you to see what this Areopagus was. This is the Areopagus. This is in Greece. It's in Athens. It is the, or it's the um, academic center of the world at that time. Now, Paul wasn't somebody that they, they, they would bring up because he wasn't, you know, although Paul was probably the most educated person there, he didn't come spouting his education. He didn't come spouting his background and how, how learned he was and all this stuff. What did he do? He went in the culture, he went in the, in the marketplace, and he talked about Jesus and about the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ. He didn't try to water it down. He didn't try to flowerize it. He didn't try to make the... I mean, let, let's just be real. A, a crucifixion is an ugly thing. I mean, it's murderers and thieves who are crucified. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was crucified crucified i don't like to talk about the blood of the the blood of cross doesn't make any sense to the world but it's the blood of jesus christ that saves us it's the blood of jesus that washes away my sin so he wasn't going there and he wasn't using flowery words and he wasn't it wasn't because of his great greatness of speech it wasn't it was because what he said was dynamite It was the power of God unto salvation. And the people were like, who is this guy? What is this stuff he's talking about? And these are all the most learned people in the world. And they come hear the guy talking on the streets, just reasoning with people. And they're, who is this guy? What did they do? That would be like taking you to Harvard or Yale or Oxford or Cambridge and putting you in front of all the, all the brilliant minds of the day and we want to hear what you have to say. It's like going on Oprah and getting your book spouted off. Now, he, the, the Epicureans and the Stoics, it's interesting because they want to hear more. Let me tell you a little bit about the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Epi- Epicureans, boy, they, they could fit right along in our culture. Man, they would fit right here super well. You know why? They pursued pleasure as the chief purpose in life. They valued most of all the pleasures and a peaceful life. Free from pain disturbing passions and uh, superstitious fears. They did not deny the existence of God, but they believed that they had nothing to do with them, that God had nothing to do with them. They believed in God. They believed in 9,000 gods. 
In fact, as we're going to see, they had one, they had one God they, that they couldn't come up with another name, so they had a statue built to the unknown God. And Paul's going to talk about that unknown God. Man, do we see a lot of Epicureans in our world today? I mean, everyone's pursuing pleasure at any cost. Live and let live. No right, no wrong. Legalize drugs. Don't go to work. Do whatever, whatever feels good, do it. You don't need to serve God. He can be, he, you can put God on a shelf. Go, pl- go have the, all the pleasure you want and don't put any place for God. You, you just live how you want and then give God the rest. I mean, that's the Epicurean culture was they had all these, all these pagan, and we're, we're going to talk more about them, but they had all these pagan gods that were all over the place and they could come and go as they want. They could worship or not worship. Their worship was a little bit different. I'll just say that. And then there were the Stoics. The Stoics were, they were pantheists. God is in everything and is everything. This podium's God. This carpet's God. This is God. This is God. Everything's God. And God's everything. They put an emphasis on moral superiority and a high sense of duty. They cultivated a spirit of proud dignity and believed that suicide was better was a better than a life with less dignity. And we see a lot of Stoics in our world today as well. well that, that's the your truth, my truth. As long as you're sincere in what you believe. It's also... Uh, and I'll just be honest, we see a lot of Stoics in the, in the um, conservative movement right now. Where they take out, it, where it's Mr. Spock. It's all logic, it's all logic, it's all logic, it's all reason. There's no feelings involved, there's no anything else. And I want to tell you, it's wrong as well. And what I see is I see a lot of Christians that follow these Stoics. That's not who God said for us to follow. So they made fun of him. They said, what is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? The word, that, the, word the Greek word there means seed spreader. It means, what they're saying is, Paul, you just heard a bunch of people talking, and now here you are on the street, and you're just talking, and you, don't really, you haven't really digested what you're saying. So we're going to bring you to the Areopagus, and we're going to put you in the center here, and then we're going to pick you apart. So, Paul, you better have your stuff together when you come to the Areopagus. The Areopagus is, uh, it's Mars Hill. Again, it's like being invited to Harvard or Oxford or some primary place for academics. But Paul goes there. He's not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He knows it's the power of God unto salvation. So what's Paul preach? Let me give you his outline. And I want to give you this outline because he uses it over and over and over and over and over. I want to give you this outline because this is what our culture and this is what the this is what our culture and this is the, what the world wants us to get rid of. Just follow me here. They want to get rid of uh, here's our here's the outline. Creation, the fall, redemption and consummation or salvation. What's the culture want us to get rid of? You can't say God created. I mean, the world's billions of years old. No, it's not. Not according to the Bible. You're ignorant. Um, Those same people who are calling you ignorant and unlearned now say that a man can have a baby. They're the same scientists. Look look what he says. Acts chapter 17, verses 22 to 25. Paul tells them about creation. 
Here he is. You have to imagine him standing in the Areopagus with all these people all over the place. And he says this, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. Let me just tell you about this place that... Um, where he's standing, Mars Hill. It, they made this place because they said that one God killed another God, uh, another God's son, and that was where he was on trial. So they built this place. It's, a t- it's literally a temple to this God. He says, Men of Athens, I perceive that every that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the worship, I found also an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it is uh, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human's hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Paul's standing on Mars Hill. He can see the statues of all the gods all around him. Even Mars Hill, again, was built because Greek mythology says that Ares, the Greek god of war, stood trial before the other gods for the murder of Poseidon's son. So Paul says, I perceive that you're very religious. I mean, I can look around and see you are very... In fact, Greece, Athens was known as the most religious city in the world. And they are lost and they're dying and they're going to hell. Because, listen to me, religion will never save you. You can be religious as you want. You can follow every edict and try to do anything you want. That religion will never get you to heaven. Paul didn't start with his exposition of Scripture like he normally would. He started with a general reference to religion. Again, Athens was known as the most religious city in the world. Paul says, hey, you see that statue over there, the statue of the unknown God? Let me tell you about the unknown God. The God that you need to know. You're worshiping all these statues. You don't even know all the names. You build all these temples to them, but you don't even know the gods that you worship. That statue over there, I was walking through the city. I saw the statue of the unknown God. I want to tell you about him. There are a lot of religious people in the world. And there are a lot of religious people whose religion is just as dead as the Greeks that Paul is addressing. We must know the foundation of who I am and where I came from to be able to talk to them. So Paul starts with creation. Listen, we have different forms of religion today. We see these, this, this religion of climate let me tell you something. I heard, uh, what's her name? Uh, speaker Nancy Pelosi said yesterday, you people are voting against Mother Earth. Mother Earth, there's no Mother Earth. There's one God. And he created everything. In fact, it was Jesus who created it. And in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, Logos. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And all things were created by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Don't tell me about Mother Earth. I know what's going to happen to the world. Why? Because the God who I serve, the God who created everything, the God who has all the answers, he's already told us what's going to happen. These climate change nuts over their religion, they cry at science. But again, the same scientists, the the people that say that a man can have a baby. Then he says, this God who created everything, he is Lord. He's Lord not only of heaven and earth, but he's not served by mankind, nor can mankind do anything for him. Let me tell you something. You 
God doesn't need anything from you. God doesn't need anything from you. God puts the very breath that you're breathing right now in your lungs. God does not need anything from you. And there are so many people that think that God needs them. You, you're lying to yourself. God doesn't need you. God loves you. He died for you. He gave, he offered everything for you. And he offers us the honor and dignity to be able to serve in his, in his ministry. But he doesn't need me. Paul goes on, he says, in fact, the one true God gives mankind the life and breath and everything. Some people think that I'm God's, uh, without me, the church wouldn't survive. You know how much money I give? Let me tell you something. You know who owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mile and the rivers and the rocks and everything in them? Listen to me, God doesn't need you. My first job as pastor, I, we went in, I came in and there was a wealthy guy in the church and I was make, we were making some changes to the church and he came in my office and he told me, let me tell you something, this church will not survive without me. There were 40 people in the church, that was it. We had 70 missionaries. We had 40 people, but we had 70 missionaries. We weren't reaching our community. We weren't doing anything. And the guy comes in and says, if I leave, this church is going to die, and you need me. And I said, sir, God doesn't need you. And if you think that your money and your, what you bring to this church is that God needs, you better go on walk out the door because you're not part of this church. And he left and I'm sitting there going, what in the world did I just do? I'm an idiot. God is not, God doesn't need anything from anybody. It's God who's faithful. It's God who's worthy. I want you to notice no compromise. Paul didn't water down the message of creation. No compromise no, uh, to appease to the academic crowd with the science of the day. No watering down of what the Bible said. He just straight up says it, that this is the one true God. And listen to me. If the God of the Bible is right, and he is the one true God, then we must adjust our lives to line up with him, not the other way around. You see, we have this consumer Christianity today where people go all around trying to find a church that will appease to what I like and what I want. Let me tell you something. You don't get to do that. Are, are there churches that do things different? Absolutely. Is there... It, if it's not compromising scripture, if it's not compromising God's word, praise God that God's using that, those churches to reach people. But we don't change God's word based on what we want. They had to change their ideas about God. They had to walk away from their own opinions and understanding of who God is according to what God says. Paul continues, look at verses uh, 26 to 29. Now, now he's let, established that, hey, there's a God who's the creator and sustainer of this world. There's one God. There's not all these gods and all these buildings and all these statues that you're building. They're nothing. Acts 17, he's going to talk about the fall. Verses 26 to 29. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live all in the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling places, that he should, or that he, or that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet He is actually not far from each one of us. In Him we live and move, and having our being, as even some of your own poets have said, 
For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that, there, that the divine being, like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art, of the imagine, art and imagination of man. Paul told them that not only is there one God, but he created all man from one man, Adam. And because of that, we are obligated to him. In other words, listen, why do people want, why are there atheists? Because if there is a God, I mean, if you reason it out, if you go through just logically, if there's a God who created me and sustains me and gives me life and breath, then I will give an account to him. Nobody likes that. So there is no God. Well, you can say that as much as you want. It doesn't make it true. Paul then quotes Eponides, a Greek poet. And Paul didn't quote him because he was a Bible scholar or because he was one of God's. He was quoting him to build a bridge. Listen to me, building bridges doesn't compromise God's word. But he's building a bridge so that they'll listen to him. I see a lot of Christians who say they're building bridges, but in truth, they're just simply justifying their own sin. Don't do that. Paul tells them that since we are offspring, all offspring of God, we are responsible to have the right idea about God. We must reject the wrong ideas about God that gold and silver and stone can possibly represent God. Why don't we have statues in our church? Because no statue represents God. Paul's saying that you admit that you're ignorant of God. You, you have a statue there that says the unknown God. You're admitting that you're ignorant about God. And in fact, they said, we don't know anything about God's. They don't want anything to do with us. We don't really know anything about them. Paul says, I'm here to tell you your ignorance is not okay. Listen, ignorance is no excuse for the law. Every day, someday, every person will stand up before God and give an account. And they're going to have to answer, what did they do with Jesus Christ? Well, I, 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 no one told me. I didn't know. There's no excuse. You will stand in judgment. Paul's saying that you admit that you're ignorant. People today don't want to hear that because they're sinners. And they're capable or culpable for their lifestyle, responsible for their sin. Contrary to popular belief, you are. Romans 6.23, the payment for sin is death. God created you. You're a sinner. This is Paul's message to the smartest people in the world. Third, verse 30, the times of ignorance... God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. There's only one way to God. And that is redemption. How do we get redemption? You've got to repent. You've got to recognize that, hey, I had a wrong view of this. I thought that the world just spun in existence and, and, and not, there's no accountability, no anything. But now I'm, you're telling me that, I, that this world was created by the one true God and that he created me and all of us are accountable to him. Yes, that's what I'm telling you. And I'm also telling you that the only way you can come to God is through repentance, that you recognize that your way was the wrong way. You need to repent and turn to God's word and understand who God says you are. Paul started by helping them to know who God is. He's the creator and sustainer of everything to show them that they are sinners who are responsible to understand God and to worship God in spirit and in truth. 
Notice it's not a soft, compromising. God loves you. Everybody loves you. You are a good person. No, you're a sinner separated by God. And God does love you. And because he loves you, he sent his one and only son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And you must line up your life to adjust your life to line up with his word. And his word says you have to repent. You have to recognize that the way you were going was the wrong way. You were going this way. You were going straight to hell. And God says, I want you to turn around and repent and recognize who the God of the Bible is. That Jesus Christ came and he died on the cross and he paid the penalty for your sin. And he wants you to repent and turn from there and turn to him. Because only through him can you have salvation. Not a soft compromising message. It is the message of the gospel. The gospel message is not a soft compromising me- message. It is a you are going to hell. You need to stop and turn around and run to Jesus. It's a confrontation of wrong ideas with a promise of eternal judgment. No one wants to say you're being judged. No one wants to say, oh, you're good. Everything's good. You said a prayer. Hallelujah. You got your ticket out of hell. Now go live however you want. Christianity in the cultural sense today is an affront to the Christianity and gospel message of Paul and of Jesus. Jesus died on a cross to get this message across for my actions and my sin. And when we water down the gospel so much that everybody's good. If you're Muslim, great. You have your God. That's your truth. Oh, you think you're going to work your way to heaven? Oh, great, that's your truth. Paul confronts them all here. In the academic capital of the world. And you know what he does? He gives the straight up gospel. There's a creator. You're a sinner. God offers redemption, but it comes through repentance that you're going this way. You need to turn around and come to Christ. Lastly, there's a consummation. Verse 31 to 34, it says, Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man who he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by the raising him of the dead. Uh, Who's he talking about there? Listen, there is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Listen, if you think your religion is going to get you there, you are wrong. And Paul stood in front of the most academically gifted people in the world, and he told them this exact message. It says, now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Imagine that. Some of us say, well, I don't want to share the gospel because people will make fun of me and people don't like me when I share the gospel. Um, Hello? But others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed among also were Dionysus the Arapagite. That's a judge. These aren't ignorant people that were joining him. They heard the gospel message and it transformed their life. Why? Because it is the power of God on salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And a woman named uh, Demarius and others with them Again, salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. You can repent. 
You can repent from your sin. You can do all kinds of good deeds in the name of whatever God you want to. And it will not get you anywhere. Culture today doesn't like the talk of resurrection of Jesus. We can't scientifically prove it. So or so many dismiss it. I would say we can scientifically prove it. There's a lot of proof there. The world doesn't like that. Je- the, the world doesn't like Jesus as the God man who died on the cross and shed his blood and rose again. They like him as a baby in a manger, but don't tell me about the blood and the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. The world doesn't like Christianity and Christians who are preaching salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Because how dare you? That, that's so exclusive. Well, it's not my message. It's the message, the gospel message. And it is good news. Many of us don't like it when we first hear it. Because I have to come to grips with the fact that I'm a sinner and that my sin separated me from God. And some of us don't like it because when I hear the gospel message that my sin separated me from God and that Christ had to die for me, I I think, well, I want to do it myself. I can't. Jesus Christ could do it because he was a perfect man. He was the God man. He came, lived a sinless life, died in, the pen- died in place of my sin, paid the penalty for my sin because his blood was pure. He never sinned. Look, I don't know where you stand with God this morning. I think there are many of you that are here this morning and that you're Christians. You've put your faith in Christ alone for your salvation. You've come to God, repented of your sin, accepted the death, burial, and resurrection as payment for your sin, and you've been forgiven. But I'm convinced in a crowd this size that somebody here has never done that. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And maybe you're here this morning and the Holy Spirit's working on your heart and, and he's knock. The Bible says that Jesus stands at the door and knocks. If anyone hears, he opens his heart's door and lets Christ come in. And maybe you're here this morning. You've never heard the gospel. You've never heard that Jesus Christ exclusively. Or maybe you've heard it, but you were never. The Holy Spirit didn't move in your heart. And maybe you're here this morning and God is speaking to your heart. And he's saying, it's, I'm telling you, this message is for you. Maybe today is the day that you come to faith in Christ. Not because I got up here and used a bunch of flowery words or a bunch of words that you. But because you recognize this morning that you're a sinner. That your sin separated you from God and from eternity in heaven with him. Maybe this morning you recognize that Jesus Christ died for your sin as well. And today you want to repent and put your faith and trust in him for forgiveness of your sin. If you're here this morning and God's dealing with you this morning and and dealing with your heart about salvation, would you look up at me right where you are? Amen. I won't call you out. I won't embarrass you in any way. Listen to me. If you're here this morning and God is dealing with you and you say, hey, pastor, today is the day. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just say this to God in your own words. It's not the words that save you. God, I recognize this morning that I am a sinner, that my sin has separated me from you. And I believe that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross in my place. And right now, I I confess that I didn't believe, but today I believe and I, I accept what you did as payment for my sin. Jesus, please forgive me my sin. I want to repent from how I was thinking. I want to change my thinking and turn to you. And if you did that this morning, I want you to know that all of heaven is rejoicing because you've moved from death unto life. You are headed to death. 
but God's forgiven you and now you're in life. Christian, this morning, we're having communion this morning. You know what communion is all about? It's about confessing our sin. It's about remembering what Christ did. We just preached about the gospel, what Jesus Christ did. Remembering why he did it. In just a moment, we're going to have an invitation. The invitation is this. I want you to sit in your seats. I want you to examine yourself. First Corinthians tells us that as a Christian, we have to examine ourselves before we take communion. For those that aren't members here, I want you to know that the communion, it's not an open communion. It's not a closed communion. It's a close communion. If you are a born-again Christian, you know that you've trusted Christ your Savior. And you're in right standing with Him. I want Communion's open to you. But if you're not, please don't take communion. It's not for you. But in just a moment, we're going to have communion. But what I want to do is I want to take a few moments. I want to sit, just sit and reflect on your life. God, am I presenting the gospel? Lord, have I repented of my sin? Am I, Lord, am I living how I ought to live? God, if I'm not, Lord, I confess and renounce that today. And I ask for your forgiveness. And I'm reminded as I take the cup and as I take the bread that I'm forgiven because you gave your body and your blood for me. And so our invitation this morning is right now in your seats. I want you, we're the, they're going to sing a song. And as that song goes, if you just, just think about it in your heart, when you're ready, you've confessed your sin, when you're ready, I want you to come take the communion cup and the wafer and go back to your seat. And then when they're done, we'll take the communion together. Father, we pray. Lord, I pray for our congregation. I pray for this church. Lord, I pray for any who, who came to faith in you today. Lord, that they understand it's not the prayer that they said, Lord, but it's a confession and renouncing of their sin. Looking to you, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. God, as we get ready to take communion, Lord, I pray that you'll deal with each of us. Help us to deal with sin in our heart before we take communion. In Christ's name.